Welcome to the Up and Under show. I'm your host, Fricky Lopesher, and today with me in the studio we have Doug Schoeninger, CEO for uh, Pro Rugby. Doug, welcome to the studio. Thank and you. Uh, today I would like you to take us uh, through you know, the start of Pro Rugby. You are the man who brought professional rugby to the United States, and um, there's a bit of controversy, and hopefully, you know, moving forward, uh, we can get it all back on track. So I will just want to start out, if you want to take us, how did you, uh, how did Pro Rugby come about? Well, it's kind of an often repeated story, so I don't have to go through all of the details, but basically we were looking for a sport in order to invest in, and someone showed us rugby, and um, originally we um, kind of passed over it, but then when we came back to it, we saw, we saw the opportunity that we still see today that, you know, kind of an underexplored commercial opportunity that could grow this really good game, a really great game, from what it's been to what it could be and give opportunities, endless opportunities to players and coaches and hopefully fans. So, you know, as the sports world is changing, there are these new opportunities. So um, a friend of ours uh, knew Nigel Melville, who at the time was the CEO of USA Rugby, who I didn't know if they were looking for this opportunity or not, but he introduced me, we spoke, and we, Nigel and I at that time, I believed, uh, shared a common vision. So after a couple months of negotiation, we ended to our agreement, and that was April of 2015, and that was the beginning. That was the beginning of it all. Now, um, you, when you look, how did your professional background, I mean, you guys were looking for a, for a sport, Right, so we had a same, we still have a statement finance company, and we were looking for uh, small sports, minor league baseball in particular at that time, to then, you know, to purchase and then build the stadium around that. So we figured rugby could be that sort of thing, and it was just very intriguing, you know, um, when we really started drilling down deep on what's been done in rugby, what the infrastructure worldwide of rugby is, and the opportunities to grow it here. Um, is why we we connected with it. Now tell me, um, your first meeting with Rugby USA and presenting your your idea, did it go as expected? It was with Nigel. It was in New York, and it was more exploratory at that point. So it wasn't there wasn't really? I think on both sides, it wasn't really. Um, there wasn't really an agenda at the first meeting. Um, in that first meeting, I found out that they had done a lot of work, right? And they had uh, talked about bringing some English clubs over. Um, the year before as kind of having like a quote-unquote Saracens or an Harlequin USA branch. And so they had done a lot of research and a lot of background work. So a lot of that was very useful to us. Um, and so to get, we were able to catch, kind of catch the curve quite quickly. Um, so we, but, you know, it was more of an understanding at that point of how we saw this growing and how important commercialism was for the game and how it could take them to the next step. I mean, it's kind of interesting to note that Nigel worked for Nike, for I think a couple of years after he, you know, he was the captain of the English team, then he was, uh, I think, the first coach of the Wasps as they went private. He was a player, obviously, as well before, and um, he worked for Nike sometime after that. So he kind of really grasped, I felt, the necessariness of commercialism that it was clearly lacking in America and arguably lacking worldwide in rugby. So is it fair to say that um, that meeting was accepted with open arms? Like oh, absolutely. Here's somebody that wants to start the professional league and fund it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think they've been, I mean, I found out they've been looking for a while. And, you know, I've subsequently found out to a lot of people that not just spoke to after our meetings, you know, we had multiple meetings over the next month, that he was really giddy with happiness, that he was so super excited that he had found someone who was willing to kind of dive deep in and do the hard work and the heavy lifting. I mean, it's noteworthy to note that this, there was an extension agreement in place when I was speaking to them that had to have an early termination. That agreement was held by the now chairman of the board of USA Rugby, Will Chang, Chad Keck, who's the chairman of RIM, the subsidiary of USA Rugby, and Mayor Donovan, who is the Denver mayor who dedicates a lot of the city resources to, uh, of Glendale to rugby. And they hadn't done anything with it. Now, there's different stories why, but basically I think uh, Will summed it up for me by saying he didn't want to take the risk, both financial or put the hard work in, which it was a lot of. And um, so they just kind of let it go. So that was actually ended about a half year early because I obviously wouldn't sign my exclusive agreement while there was another one in place because it wouldn't be exclusive then, would it? So, um, you know, uh, but that's a fact I think a lot of people don't know, that there was this 
same agreement in place for about two and a half years prior. Okay, well, well um, that brings me to just asking you a fantastic 2016 se season. I had a, a chance to um, announce some of those games, so I, I had a chance to follow it firsthand. Um, w if you have to look at successes and struggles for that first season, um, is there any highlights on, on either side that you that you would or would not do again? Well, I mean, part of the first season was, was and I referred to it, and I still do as a beta season, was making mistakes, right? So you knew where to act. We did very little local activation, and we found out that, in fact, some was necessary in some markets. Some markets, like Ohio in particular, was quite, a, quite um, keen for it, right? You know, some of our TV numbers there, though it was our least produced in terms of number of cameras, et cetera, venue, it had the most watch, the most eyeballs, which, and they were quite high in some games, and on average, I believe about twice as high as Columbus Crew had for their games, home games. So, now mind you, it was a limited supply, and it was, it was new and it was novel, but um, so that was, you know, on, on the basis that it was a beta year, I think it was super successful. You know, it, it answered a lot of the questions we had. Unfortunately, I have, it also answered a lot of the fears I had, which had concerned about USA Rugby and World Rugby support. Um, you know, I had made it perfectly clear to them, I thought, that I wasn't going to allow us to be penalized by our success. Because I knew the success was there, no one had actually tried to make a thing of rugby. And this was the, obviously the first step of it, only the first step. And I wouldn't allow the journey to be uninterrupted. And they agreed at the time, obviously, or I wouldn't have started. And um, in fact, unfortunately, that's what happened. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at success, um, the 2016 final, I, I don't think you could have a better Hollywood script for the way that that played off, the amount of people that watched that f particular final and the, the, just the crowd. And the, it was an amazing final. And the, the best part was it wasn't scripted, right? So we didn't really have a final. It just happened to be the final. And, you know, so the, the, everyone, uh, all the gods lined up on that for sure. And I think that was just a reward for all the hard work that everyone put into up to that point. And um, it was great. You know, it was un unforeseen, but great. But you would imagine being on that trajectory where all the viewing rugby fans, uh, by now we're adding to the, to the viewing population. You had this, like you said, it wasn't a final, but it ended up being a final and a fairy tale, if you, if you want, ending, um, to bring us to a point where, you know, now we have to pull the plug. So, you know, you have this great success. You would imagine that everybody and, and their sister and brother that plays rugby or that's involved in rugby would like to see this product to move forward to the next season, and um, that wasn't the case. I mean, if you look at some of the outside influences and the headwind that you, that you take, you would have imagined that the success of, of your first season would just want everybody to jump in, and, and it doesn't seem like it went down that way. Well, actually, but the contrary, unfortunately, it made the people even more hateful. Um, you know, I guess one of the earliest signs of the existing rugby community, and mind you, most people are great, right? There's just a few of the self-appointed leaders that were quite negative from the beginning that turned up more negative, right? And um, I don't understand it, you know. Uh, to me, it was a win-win for everyone, kind of rising tide floats all boats. But some people just can't get beyond that and beyond themselves. So this is where we ended up. When would you say was the first time that you knew something wasn't, wasn't on track? Well, it, 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 contemporarily at the time, the first time was probably when Nigel resigned. Um, even though I thought we had a very close relationship, he hadn't let me know. And then he ensured me at that time, because I was very concerned, that he would button up some of the agreements that were still loose. Doc, sorry for interrupting. The word button up was used verbatim. Yeah, in an email, right, yeah. He would button things up before he left, referring to the agreement, obviously, because it's the only thing we ever talked about, and the term extension, and just the relationship. Because he, now, unfortunately, I find out, was kind of working there within a vacuum, I guess. Now, obviously, he had board approval for everything he did, and he had authority to do everything he did, which was enough for me. But I guess there wasn't total agreement. I now subsequently believe that very few people within U.S. or wherever you agree with anyone ever on anything. So it's not surprising that he had to op operate unilaterally a lot of times. And actually, there is an email he actually says, he, I'm on something very minor, and he says, oh, screw it, I'm just going to do it, meaning he wasn't going to wait for them never receiving board approval because they didn't operate that professionally. So, I mean, let me, in layman's term, if I'm going to go into signing a 
you know, a deal that's going to involve a lot of money. I'm going to, I'm going to want an exclusive right, um, you know, on rugby. Can you explain to us and the viewers just more or less um, what that exclusive agreement, you know, entails and, you know, you know what it looks like? Right. So the agreement that is still in place is an exclusive right for 15 aside rugby in America, uh, in, in the USA, and for rugby union, obviously. And obviously, going forward, at the time, we knew we had to make large investments, much larger than our first year. I mean, our plan was the second year to triple our investment versus our first year. And we were only going to do that with the certainty that we had something to protect, you know, we had some protection to protect that investment because obviously you don't, you're not going to lose tons of money for three years and then walk away without loss. So funny enough, that's what they believe my business plan was. Um, so, uh, you know, well, clearly we had an agreement that we were going to have a long enough runway to make up that money um, and more. And it would feel that, you know, at least 10 to 15 years would probably be the number that would be cement us as the primary level league in America, very much like MLS. I mean, they like to structure themselves like MLS or soccer does in America, where there's a primary league and one or two secondary leagues. And that was always a part of the agreement. And there was always going to be a sub league to us. Uh, the talk of the time was we were still, we were kind of the sub league, you know, we hadn't really graduated to a full professional league. So it was kind of too early to introduce a sub league. Obviously there's a limited number of American players too, that you didn't want it to be up to, to, uh, to uh, thinly. Okay. Now the agreement that is exclusive would then not allow any, any uh, rugby league to compete, any union 15 league to compete with you guys during the same time as that? Right. The verbiage in the agreement is a domestic club, so that would be any club that would be domesticized here. There's a carve-out in the agreement that was added that um, at, towards the end of our negotiations where they carved out that any national team play and one-off events could be allowed if they were done through USA Rugby, and that was always agreed to. But any league play was exclusively our domain, and that was always the agreement um, for the obvious reason, right? You know. Um, you know, now, subsequently to all this happening, they dream about having a pro 14 or 12 team at the time made up exclusively of Eagles players. So when you think about why that would be disruptive to our league, it's pretty obvious, right? We wouldn't have the best players. They would be on this other team. You know, which all goes back to the agenda of USA Rugby. You know, is it, it's not necessarily what I thought it was or it appeared to be, which was to grow the game and give more opportunity to players and coaches and fans. But to keep control of it and to just make sure that their 40 players to play on the international level are the best possible. You know, I think that's important, but I think it's much more important that the game grows in number of players and that the 40 players will be an outgrowth of a great professional league, not converse, right? Not that this 40 player national team pool leads the charge. Like, say, an example in Argentina, where their professional, there's a total of one professional team in the whole country because that's the way they want it. That wouldn't work here. And it was never our agreement, obviously, because it makes no sense. You'd be employing 40 people. Doug, um, let's, it's time to pay uh, a tribute to our sponsors, and we will be right back after this message. Rickers wrote the book on fun, food, sports, and spirits. Bring your friends and family and enjoy all the fun that Frickers has to offer. Mouth-watering chicken wings, boneless wings, frickin' chicken chunks, burgers, fries, and kids eat free every day. Want to watch the game? We've got TVs everywhere. And our selection of drafts, IPAs, and craft beers is second to none. For fun, food, sports, and spirits, we wrote the book, Rickers. <laughs> 